Hello and welcome to this debate hosted here at Cancer Research UK in London. We're here to talk about patient centricity within clinical trials uh, with my three guests here. Um, Professor Johnson, why don't you uh, begin by introducing yourself? How do you do? I'm Peter Johnson. I'm a medical oncologist and a researcher and I've been responsible for designing and carrying out a number of clinical trials over the years. Hi, I'm Margaret Grayson. I am a cancer patient and I'm part of CRUK's involvement, uh, partnering with researchers and helping to move research forward. And I'm Christian Hebenstreit. Uh, I'm the general manager uh, for Europe, Middle East and Africa at Medidata. Medidata is providing uh, cloud solutions uh, and CRUK is one of our customers. We're happy to partner with them. Excellent. Professor Johnson, why don't we start with you? Historically, why is patient centricity within clinical trials is still a topic that we need to discuss. I think we've made a lot of progress over the last few years in involving patients much more in research and particularly in the UK and particularly through Cancer Research UK. We've seen more and more people with the illnesses that we're researching taking part in designing the trials, helping to work out how we best do them, helping to work out how we measure the things that are important. But that's not a universal finding and certainly in other countries and often in the pharma sector we've seen much less patient involvement and it's, so it's very patchy. And I think this stems partly from a old-fashioned idea that the doctors knew best and patients just did what was advised. And I think that's really changed. The whole dynamic of healthcare has changed and with it so has the way that we involve participants in research. So we're now starting to see patients as actual consumers of the medicine as well. Does that bring to with you, Margaret, as a patient yourself? Can I say I've just seen the organisation have a whole cultural change um, in having the patient voice central to looking at research design and the research projects. Uh, and that's quite amazing. Obviously, there was quite a lot of um, scepticism about, well, what do I do with a patient around a table? Um, what, what do they bring? And the, the, the clinicians, the researchers, they're the experts. They have years of experience and knowledge. Um, but what do I bring? What do patients bring? We're also experts. Uh, we're experts at living with the disease, at going through the treatments. So if you bring both of those areas together in partnership, look at the strength that that gives to research. Excellent. And could you just give an example of a particular case, an example which has been particularly impressive? There was one that came from the Centre for Drug Development to our um, Cancer Insights panel. And that uh, project had not been recruiting very well. But when um, they brought the information sheet to us as a panel, um, it was obvious when we looked at it that there was a lot of words, big blocks of words um, that needed a bit of understanding. But especially it was a head and neck study for a window study that between diagnosis and going for surgery. Um, it was only for two or three weeks. But it wasn't obvious from the, the information that had taken part in the study didn't delay the surgery. And that was one of the big things that needed, while that was true, it wasn't obvious from writing and reading the information sheet. So there were some other thoughts put back um, about the information sheets and about diagrams. Um, and that changed, I think, the, the recruitment over the nice next nine months for that study, uh, but also uh, changed the process for the um, Centre for Drug Development in that now all of their studies and patients look at the information sheets. And in fact, um, they've even gone one step further in the fact that new staff coming in um, have a specific um, involvement training pack for within their department so that they can immediately start to think, well, where and how could I involve patients? I think you raise a really important point. Um, the fixation on the part of the researchers is with the kind of nuts and bolts of organising the study and then all this terrible regulatory stuff that has to go over the top of it and the reams and reams of information which people think they have to put into these information sheets. So you end up with information sheets which are 20, 30 pages long, all densely typed and really impenetrable to, to me, let alone somebody who's coming at it in a, in a high stress situation with just being told that they, they've got a difficult to treat cancer and would they like to be part of a trial. And I think it's a question of how you 
change the perspective with which you come at the information. And I think having somebody who's had the illness has been through these processes to look at what the information is, how it's being presented, and what's being what they're being expected to take in is really important and it completely changes the way that you go about conveying this information. I think we do it at the moment in a really old-fashioned way. Christian, from your perspective, do those ring true or what are you seeing and why now? Why are we seeing this impetus for patient inclusion now when seemingly these issues have we've had these for decades? I like those examples, you know, that you are bringing in um, that uh, we don't want to give a patient who's already faced with a very serious situation of his life uh, we don't want to give him 30, 40, 50 pieces of paper to go through. So there are better ways in order to connect with the patients. So, so there are e-consent solutions, for instance, you know, where you can uh, work with videos. You know, you can make it a bit more understandable rather than going through these enormous amounts of information, which is important because, you know, we're in a, in a, in a serious and regulated industry. But I think it's important to be more uh, customer or patient centric in this sense in order to better, faster and bring drugs to patients um, in a much better way. I think it's really interesting the how little has changed as the rest of the world has moved to electronic solutions, to digital communication. We're, I'm still sitting in my clinic giving people 30-page information sheets typed in Courier 10 point to read, where actually what they need is a five-minute video that they can look at on their phone or something. And, and it's extraordinary how slow the pace of progress has been in this industry. Partly, I think it is because people are terrified of the regulation, which is completely stupid. I think there's some work to be done among some of the clinical researchers as well. Um, I, when I have conversations with colleagues from different parts of the world, a lot of them say, well, we're not quite sure why we can't speak for the patient. You know, we look after patients all the time. Surely we understand how they think. And there's just a failure to understand that it is just a different perspective that comes into the equation. Peter, could you just quickly outline exactly what these clinical trials will lose if they aren't patient-centric? At the moment, we have an ever-increasing number of new drugs and new types of treatment coming through for cancer. And we have to be able to find out whether they work, whether they add value, whether they help people. And the only way of doing that is to run clinical trials. But as the number of these things goes up, so we need more and more people than ever before to take part in the trials. And unless we get the way that we convey the information and engage people with the question right, we're always going to struggle to make progress as quickly as we should. And seemingly, Christian, there's going to be an impact on the actual drug development at the end of it too. Obviously it has because we are looking into different areas right now and uh, the challenge, uh, you know, finding the right patients, you know, is still there and it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's, uh, you know, we need to find the right quality and quantity of patients in order to set up successfully clinical research projects or clinical trials and doing this um, is a challenge, you know, because, you know, we're in London today, you know, but if, you, you know, if this organization is, uh, is planning to set up a successful clinical trial, you know, for a specific type of cancer, it's difficult to find the right patients. And, uh, and nowadays, it should be possible and it's becoming more and more common practice, you know, that we're also looking uh, to patients, you know, who are 100, 200, 300 miles away. And I think that's a, that's a major differentiator because you don't have to come to the GP or to the doctor all the time. Uh, um, you know, in former days, you needed to see your doctor uh, on a regular basis. And what I need today is basically something like this. So this is uh, my distance to my clinical trial. So it's basically 40 centimeters. Uh, you know, it's the distance between me and my smartphone. And by utilizing new technologies will help us both uh, to recruit a better quality and quantity of patients. You know, but it's also helping us to engage with patients in a much better way, in a, in a completely different way. Um, and finally, to get better data more data, but also engage with the patient in a completely uh, new and better way. I think it's really important for the population, for wherever we live, to understand that without research, we don't go anywhere. Okay? Um, as I went through my treatment, it was only then I realized the importance of research. Research decided the technique from a mastectomy, research decided the combination of chemotherapy drugs. It decided the dose and fractionation of radiotherapy, the drug I took this morning. All of that was decided by research. And I think part of it is as, as patients um, and as, as researchers and clinicians to educate the population so that they should expect to be asked about clinical trials, that they're not something that like turns people green or they're guinea pigs, but it's part of excellence in care, in healthcare. So I see research as making good healthcare 
excellent healthcare. And so there's an education um, element behind it all. It sounds like patients now becoming partners within their own um, treatment. That sounds like a, a massive step forward, Peter. Patients have always been the, the most important focal point of cancer treatment. Um, and anybody who doesn't get that probably isn't doing it very often. Um, what's changing, I guess, is that the research is, is much more pivoting around towards making sure that the patient's point of view and the way they feel about it is, is taken into account, not just at the moment when you have the conversation about taking part in a trial, but a long way beforehand, so that the whole design, the whole structure of the system is, is much more that way orientated. Similarly, I think we, we measure the results of our treatments in quite an old-fashioned way. Um, if we want to know how patients feel, we tend to give them, again, a paper-based quality of life questionnaire with a whole series of questions that they have to tick the right answer to. Again, why are we doing it this way? It's tremendously burdensome for us to give out bits of paper, to collect the bits of paper which get lost, and then they all have to be uploaded onto some database and analyzed. There must be quicker and slicker ways of doing this, which would actually be more appealing to people. Um, the, the technology is there. We need to move it into the space where people relate to these things. People spend their whole day on their phones. Anybody who's got teenage children knows that it, there's something strangely addictive about a tiny screen. So, and the amount of time people spend waiting in clinics, for example, they could be doing all sorts of really useful stuff, like telling us how they feel, rather than just sitting there wishing that the time would pass. And I think this is one of the biggest differentiators or changes that we saw over the past couple of years. So we did virtual trials years and years and years ago, you know, but these were including very special, you know, very complicated devices, you know, which were at the patient at home. And nowadays, as you said, you know, you know you've got your iPhone, you've got your Fitbit, uh, you've got other devices, you've got sensors at home, and we can make use of this because they're already there. They're the patient's own devices. And so therefore the acceptance of this technology is already there and utilizing this um, is a big advantage that we're having today. I think that's mm -hmm. enormous. The CR UK are, are piloting at the moment, um, something that the patients have been involved in signing. It's a paper model at the moment for the pilot, pilot but obviously if it's successful, it's going to be gone technical. Um, model but it's looking at not just asking well what do you think of your hospital your doctor or anything like that it's asking the question what is your experience of going through this clinical trial as you go through it um, so that that can be fed back that can be an understanding for other people and I know that part of that um, reply to those is that was the waiting time in a specific trial that has been able to be changed. And I think the, the important thing on that invita invitation to share your thoughts and feelings is the fact that it says there are some things that we perhaps cannot change, but we would like to know your views anyhow. And I think if you ask a patient their views, they also have to have that as part of it, that perhaps we can't change it because it's regulations but we want to hear your views. So those things are moving on. That's very vital information. Um, and if that was developed further, then that gives experience of that clinical trial to share with other people, to help with recruitment, to help especially with retention. Patient involvement is being part of the decision-making, uh, being part of the design uh, at different parts of the research cycle before that clinical trial actually gets to the participant who's the patient. Uh, but if you put them together, then that gives a sm smoothness of the whole system and it links it up. Excellent. From a sponsor point of view, Peter, is that feasible right now? I think it's eminently feasible and, and organisations like Cancer Research UK are doing an enormous amount of working out how best to involve patients at every stage of the, of the research cycle. Um, I think historically the pharmaceutical industry has had much more trouble with this um, for reasons I'm, I'm not really quite sure I understand. I think it's to do with um, being a bit concerned with secrecy and confidentiality and also not wishing to have the process of research design kind of derailed or, or, or changed by having patient involvement. But it seems to me to be short-sighted to take that view because in the end, the people who are going to need to take part in the research than people who are going to be 
uh, using the treatments that are being developed are those very patients. So it seems to me that having them involved at the earliest possible stage in thinking about the process is absolutely critical. Is that quite frustrating from your side there, Christian, from a technology point, just wanting to basically innovate this space and make it faster and more agile? I think we're, I think we're seeing a lot of changes today. And I think, you know, the fact that the entire industry is changing, uh, um, you know, is very positive. And uh, so what we see, you know, when we talk with one of our uh, clients or customers or partners, you know, companies or sponsors or CROs are successful a patient-centric organization if this transformation is coming top down. So therefore it needs to come from the top because patient centricity is really impacting each and every piece of an organization. And if one part of this organization is not becoming patient-centric, the entire organization or the entire mission uh, will fail. Um, you know, we see very, very good examples you know, and CRUK is one example, you know, but even the big ones like Novartis, uh, you know, are going that route right now. Um, it's, it's very positive and, and, um, you know, when I talk to clients and partners across the globe, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic, you know, that we can achieve a lot in the next uh, upcoming years. Is that what you're seeing, Peter, from your side? Does that sound reasonable? Um, I, th I think we are, I hope, going to see big changes coming through as the technology arrives. Um, it's, it's notable how long it's taken for change to occur in this sector. I think we have a profoundly risk-averse um, or risk um, fighting set of situations, whether it's coming from the regulators or the sponsors or the people conducting the research or the contract research organizations. And between us, we seem to have found it impossible to make progress in adopting new technology and moving from paper to digital to more um, intelligent forms of interaction with participants in trials than has been the case up to now. We, we're stuck in a kind of 1960s model of the way we operate. Um, so I think it's ripe for change, and I'm really hoping that that will happen. Uh, and I think patients are probably some of the most powerful advocates in making that the case. But in talking about um, using the technology within clinical trials, I think to bring patients on board who are participants for to use technology, staff have to be at ease to use it. Um, and be able to communicate how, how good it is. Uh, also, if it's safe and they're um, co confidential, um, all of that. Um, so that's a, a big area of, I think, again, education and good communication. And looking at the, the external technology uh, factors, we know we've got more wearables now. Um, Apple Smartwatch and the Alphabet ECG have just been um, approved by the FDA in the last year or so. Um, are patients amenable to be using that for passive collection of data? Because that difference between active and passive collection of data could be a real game changer within clinical trials. I think it is, again, the, a trust element. Is this safe? Now, people in the community quite happily go to their store and use their, their card, their loyalty card and everything, and don't think anything of that. Um, but I think, it, again, Perhaps it's working with patients to educate the rest of the community with the tech companies um, about safety, about how it's used, and is it confidential and the trust. I'm assuming you, I absolutely agree, you know, because you know you are bringing up you know you know one of if not the most important uh, you know part of this conversation. Patient data belongs to the uh, belongs to the patient. So this is your data, and we are allowed to make use of this in order to uh, provide probably better solutions uh, to other patients. And I think this is something that we also should keep in mind. Trust is, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects mm -hmm. in this area. And uh, you know, we as an industry, we need to be very, very aware of this. Is uh, you know that this is something which should be in the center of everything we do. And um, I just see you know that the value that we can generate out of those ongoing data flows that we see. And I wouldn't even call it active and passive data. So this is an ongoing data flow that we can see. And we constantly can exchange um, information with, between the patient and the research project. This is an enormous value that we're getting out of it. This is a question maybe for all of you or any of you, but should the next hire for biotech company be the chief patient officer? Who owns or who should own this entire debate? I'm not sure you need a chief patient officer. What you need is an intelligent program for involving the patients in 
the way that the research is designed and conducted, uh, and some dedicated capability for making sure that you're reaching the right constituency of people, that you're bringing people on board at an early stage to the research design, absolutely, I think would be a real step forward. Yes, I think, I think it's uh, having that collaboration um, and a partnership in working together when we move it forward. I think the organization needs to be patient-centric and this is involving uh, you know, each and every player from regulators to sponsors to CROs uh, and technology companies like ours. I think this is something that we all uh, need to work on and uh, um, so therefore I think you know, this is something that we all should keep in mind. What will be the first um, piece of advice you'd give um, a sponsor to engage with this kind of system? I would say when you're designing your next clinical study, um, have a patient in the room while you're thinking about what you're going to do, what the question is you're trying to ask, how you're trying to answer it. Have a patient there from the word go. Yes, I think that's important. And also not to be, I think, um, frightened of patients in the room. I th and frightened might be the word, but um, that most of us who are involved in research and working with researchers have as much passion for their research as the researcher has, because we want to see it happen. And so that's why there's um, that partnership. And I so admire researchers, clinicians over the years. Um, I, their passion is amazing. But those of us who are involved in research and understand the importance of it are also passionate for many different reasons for wanting to be there. Completely agree, and, and I think it's a partnership. You know what we see right now. The good thing is that uh, you know that many stakeholders are realizing you know that there is something to do, and uh, the positive aspect is you know that even the regulators are now you know making a big push towards this direction. So when we are talking to the FDA, when we read statements from the FDA, when we are talking to the MHRA or the EMA, um, there is a big, big, big push coming towards patient centricity right now. So therefore, the openness in terms of adopting new better things for patients. Um, I think this is something which is completely different when we just look back just a couple of years ago. And, and this is in a UK centric conversation. We could expand this globally. What are the barriers then when thinking about international studies, getting a, a wider pool of data, hopefully for better longitudinal studies? I think what we saw is uh, over the past years, you know, that as you said, studies were very much limited, to, you know, to one country or to one region. Uh, studies are becoming more and more global nowadays, uh, you know, which can be executed based on the technology, uh, you know, which can adopt those virtual trials, as we call them. So you can really find your patients in other parts of this world, other regions. And uh, I think this is one of the biggest advantages that we see right now. So therefore, uh, the opportunity, you know, to build global studies, uh, also making clinical trials a bit more diverse yeah, and inclusive because that's something, you know, where the industry wasn't so good at over the past years. Um, that's an opportunity that we can now capture. You know, I think this is different from former years. And, uh, you know, this excites me, honestly, you know, when I'm taking a look uh, of what's happening today. Yeah. Peter, Christian mentioned briefly there about diver diver diversity and inclusion. And that's a slightly more nuanced debate. It's not about putting the patient center, it's about making sure the right mix of patients are present, which kind of exposes some of the bias that have historically been in the industry. Does that compound the strides making to um, include more patients or is that just um, a separate um, debate one has to have? I think, I think representativeness and inclusiveness um, are still big issues for a lot of areas of research. And we know that there are substantial biases in how groups are represented in different different studies. Um, it varies from place to place and it varies according to what sort of study you're talking about. Um, but for example, very elderly patients are underrepresented, uh, black and ethnic minority patients are underrepresented in trials in the West. Um, so I think we still have to concentrate on working out how we make trials as accessible as we can possibly make them to all parts of the population. I think the NHS does a very good job in terms of inclusivity for treatment, but nonetheless, we still know that there's much more that we can do, and particularly for research participation. Uh, I, th I think sponsors recognize the need to have proper representation of the population in their clinical trials, 
but in many ways they're several steps away from the people that they want to include and what they need to do when they're designing the studies and designing the information and looking at where they're going to recruit subjects to their trials is to make sure that they're doing everything they possibly can to be as broadly representative. Do different communities, Margaret, have to be on board and in different ways? I think you have to work with communities, um, hard to reach communities and hard to engage with and to be included in research specifically. Um, that has been a problem, an ongoing problem. Uh, it's not an insurmountable problem, it just has to be worked at. Um, and sometimes I think perhaps going to an area um, that there's a strong community person in, that the community you're trying to reach has a trust in, um, and the researchers going, explaining and working with them, but also taking um, a patient who's involved already um, and, and letting people see that research is not to be frightened of, um, that their safety is paramount to the researchers and have an understanding of research. Uh, communication, perhaps, but it's not a, an easy solution, perhaps just needs worked out a little bit more. A bit more time. Time and effort and time is a, a big thing, obviously. As a, as a closing remark from all three of you, what does an ideal patient-centric clinical trial look like? Briefly, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe I can start. Uh, you know, I don't want to repeat myself, you know, but basically this is an industry change and we shouldn't underestimate the progress that we as an industry have already done over the past year. So, uh, you know, we are not starting from ground zero here. And it's, it's, it's a big step forward, you know, which I saw in this industry over the upcoming two or three years. So, you know, when you're a patient today, when you're a cancer patient today, your chances uh, to have a better and longer life are much, much better than just a couple of years ago. So this is upfront. So we did already make an enormous amount of progress. But as I said, you know, this is an industry change and this is an organizational change. It needs to come uh, top down and an entire organization needs to change in order to become patient centric. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, you know, um, let all stakeholders talk to each other. So we need to talk to patients, CROs, uh, regulators, pharma companies. So we need to come together and find a way, you know, how we can make uh, our industry and uh, you know the things that we are doing more patient centric. I think then we are on a good way forward. I see it just very much as a culture change, and I've seen it happening and and going on happening, um, and that's a continuation of that. And it's a, a process of uh, listening to each other, not just talking at people, but listening, uh, looking at the way forward, how things can be improved for everyone, um, and making sure that that continues. It's really keeping the patient voice central in all that is happening. Mm. I think a properly patient-centric piece of research uh, will be one which makes sense to patients easily when it's explained to them, which appeals to them as something to take part in, which captures their imagination as being a good idea, uh, and in a way is self-generating in that the the chat rooms and the social media groups and the groups of self-organizing patients who talk about these things will actually be keen to do it. And I think if we get to that position with studies, then we'll be able to make progress in research much faster than before. Peter, Margaret, Christian, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your insights. <laughs>